And welcome back. Our next guest, a true force for change, dedicated to fostering critical conversations on race, justice, and equity. Now, with a rich background in academia as well as the arts, she's committed to empowering underrepresented communities as well as amplifying their voices. She is the vice president at Center State CEO, and also she holds a degree in integrative arts from Penn State University, a master's degree in higher education and student affairs, and then also a PhD in higher education with a focus on race and equity from Indiana University. So I says, well, why is that important? Well, I need you to know she and seven of her colleagues made history at, Indi at Indiana University, the largest group uh, to get the PhD and uh, graduated with PhD simultaneously in the School of Education. They were deemed the great eight and they were featured in the 2016 Ebony Magazine's Power 100 list. And so we are pleased to have Dr. Johanna Rogers with us. And I'm glad to have you sharing. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be back. Yes, <laughs> glad to have you back. You know, listen, we're having this conversation, and conversation is what's needed. Um, oh, okay. Talking about what's going on today, um, you know, we're up in the Northeast, but in the Southeast, we know what's happening. DEI, mm -hmm. huge uh, issue. Florida immediate termination of people as soon as DEI law is passed to retract. Mm -hmm. In many ways, it seems like we're going 40 years back. back. Yeah, yeah. And it's scary. Right. It's scary. Um, I was just out in Las Vegas uh, for a conference, and, you know, it, it hit me because there are um, colleges and universities when they uh, repeal the affirmative action um, legislation uh, that is cutting programs and programs that I know my parents have benefited from, many folks have benefited from, um, and it's like, okay, well, what will happen if we know, you know, policies and practices haven't changed, right? Uh, DEI, uh, if it's if it's done well, and I'll say that again, if it's done well, right. it should be empowering people to think about the broad human experiences, right? What growing up in poverty means. And it doesn't just mean that you might have limited resources. Those limited resources create a lived experience that might not get you exposed to opportunities that help you complete the SATs or ACT um, or regions in the same way as students that grew up in uh, an upper class household, right? And so how do we take those things into consideration, right? right? That's what, you know, affirmative action, you know, DEI, um, critical thinking around equity helps us to do, right? Um, and when we take that away, you know, what, what begins to happen? And uh, right now, as we see almost eight states banning and outlawing the slashing of jobs for folks that have been doing the work that has gotten a lot of people into a lot of places that they wouldn't have been in. So what does that leave us to look forward to? Yeah. We've got critics who say that when it comes to DEI, and when we talk about DEI, for those who may not be so familiar, diversity, equity, and inclusion. That's mm -hmm. pretty much what mm -hmm. DEI means. And uh, we can break down a little bit more in just a second. But... When we talk about critics of DEI, they say, mm -hmm. listen, it's basically dealing with race mm -hmm. and racism, and mm -hmm. we don't need to do that. We're, we're okay. We're good. Mm -hmm. We're in a post-racial America. Are we, though? <laughs> mm -hmm. Did you see my face? Right, 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 right. We're right. in a post-racial America, right? right? Like, so we mm -hmm. know that's not real. No, that's but not real. how do you counter those critics who say, listen, you know what, when it comes to DEI, right. it's really about race, but I argue that it's more about cultural competency. It's more about cultural, well, it starts with cultural competency, right? And, and the thing that when I'm working with leaders, when we are developing experiences, we, I often say, right, let's start with race because that's one of the taboo things that we don't really talk about, right? Mm -hmm. We could be sitting next to each other. We could be in a cubicle. We've worked together 20 years, but we really never talk about how, what happens when I leave work. If I'm driving through the neighborhood to get to where my office is, do I feel safe? Have I been stopped? When I get hired, even for many professionals that are climbing the corporate ladder, right, and, and you're earning the monies, do I feel comfortable moving into so-called the good neighborhoods, right? Mm -hmm. Like, when we talk about inclusivity, 
and diversity of an organization. We're talking about, yes, there's different people that should be embraced and feel comfortable working there. But depending on gender, depending on people's faith, depending on the socioeconomic background that they're coming from, it may impact their lens. They may see things differently. And so um, I think that scares some folks mm -hmm. because they feel uncomfortable, right? Like, ooh, you know, we didn't ever talk about this. I don't know how to talk about it. I don't know if, you know, I'm going to make others uncomfortable. I'm going to ask a stupid question. And sometimes I'm like, you need to ask the stupid questions. Mm -hmm. And we need to, like, check you about it and educate you on why it's not an appropriate question or how is it, you know, offensive. And then let's move on to the next point, right? How do we build more diverse products for all audiences? How do we think about pharmaceutical sales in different communities and access to medicines, right? Like, that's when, if we really sit down and engage in equitable conversations, those could be some of the outcomes, mm -hmm. right? Instead of putting out products and then going, uh-oh, you know, the price mark or where it's located or um, stores in certain zip codes aren't getting access to products in the same way. Why? Right? And, and when I think about putting it out there like that, right, it seems like a no-brainer, but we know that it's not a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. We know that there's a lot of resistance. Mm -hmm. And I think that sometimes people are very comfortable remaining ignorant. Yeah. Because it all requires you to get out of your comfort. Right. And for some folks, the, you know, when we talk about uh, privilege or things of that nature or with leadership. I often challenge folks to think about if you, if you were a college student in the 80s or 90s and you were in the business school or wherever you were on campus and you've gone into corporate America and been working in corporate since then, you, you probably weren't required to take a class that talked about culture mm -hmm. um, if you didn't choose to. Right. And so some, there are folks that have worked 30 and 40 years that didn't have to think about pronoun usage or <laughs> um, women's pay and how they set up salaries. They weren't challenged. We didn't ask questions. And if you weren't trained to do that, then you're probably just doing the same thing that you learned how to do when you came into your profession. Right. And so now when we talk about DEI, you got to think a little bit on your job. And so if you have your formula and your routine set up, or like, okay, I'm going to do this from 8 to 4.30, and then I can walk out the door, you know, thinking more equitably about things might mean, oh, well, this, this step right in this job description is going to take a little bit more thought. It's not going to be like I could just pull the one we've been using for the past 10 years or three years off the website. Like, let's think about if we really need a college degree mm -hmm. or if lived experience could happen. Let's talk about, okay, salary bands and, and where this person falls and what we're asking them to do. And is it reflective of my position, right? right? And, and that's the deeper thinking folks have to do when they were like, oh yeah, I don't, you know. Right. right. Like, I don't want to hold anybody back, but don't ask me to change what I've been doing because that's going to take 15 minutes off my commute <laughs> mm -hmm, right, exactly. And I cannot be like, bothered. Like, I don't want to do that. I figured it out already. Right. Right? And, and when I say that in front of folks, they start laughing because it's so true. It's, it's so true and it's so real. And I think yeah. that we have to really, if we want real results, we have to put real work in. And, that, and that's universal, right? Mm -hmm. Now, there's more folks that probably don't look like us that are in the majority of those leadership positions, but everybody... Right, even folks that do look like us are in those same position where I'm like, okay, y'all want me to go outside of what I've been doing? I, I've established my routine, mm -hmm. right? And that's where when we really start to talk about this, this isn't about there is a black and white element, there is a race element, but there's also an LGBTQIA right. issue, right? There's also a women's issue. And black men may not be comfortable talking about why, um, you know, health care is important to their female counterparts in ways that they may not have to consider and what that means or mothering and what that puts on their female employees and how do we support that in a different way, right? So... I, and I want to switch gears just for a second. I got because I'm got i almost out of time with you, but I want to take the time to share a little bit about your work with women yeah. because you have two things. Number one, you have a show, Behind the Woman. Mm -hmm. And then also I want to talk about the fact that you are touring on a one-woman show on yeah. college campuses. Yeah, yeah. So talk to me about the one-woman show. 
Yeah, well, um, when I finished my PhD, you mentioned that I, I felt a weight because I was passionate about doing this equity work, but I'm also an artist. And so um, during COVID, when we had, you know, the world stop and we were inside, we had so much time. And so I started working on um, another degree that was focused in the arts, right? And I feel like, okay, well, I got a job. Now I can do some more artistic stuff because, you know, my mama was like, Listen, that's cute. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, but we need right, to make sure right, you have a paycheck. Right. right. And so I did that. And so I started um, my MFA because I always have loved playwriting. Um, you know, there's a television show where I get to sit down and tell women's stories. And I want to try to find ways to do it on different stages. And so with my experience um, at a graduate student at IU, there were so many moments where the pursuit of education and talking about my community was a challenge, mm -hmm. right? Um, similar to what we're seeing now in different ways. And so I wanted to talk about what it took for, for me being a young black female coming out of um, you know, the metro area, growing up in Jersey, doing a lot of artistic stuff between the city and there, and making it in academia. And so um, I wrote a story about what it's like to grow up in zip codes where everybody's like, well, we're not going to expect much. You mm -hmm. know, black or brown girls from this neighborhood, you know, they're just, they're not necessarily the most respectable individuals, right? Mm -hmm. All those negative stereotypes about urban communities um, and what it took to sit in the classroom and challenge those ideas to advocate for myself and how it creates a sense of questioning. Some people call it imposter syndrome at mm -hmm. times where you feel like, okay, do I really belong? Am I gonna say something? How do I represent my community, right? right. Um, and so my show Shattering deals with all of that or talks about all of that. And I use poetry and uh, spoken word to express the frustration and angst mm -hmm. that I felt. Um, and one of the things I thought to do was, well, go back to the campuses where, you know, they're gonna be the girls that come from your neighborhood, right, that are trying to get to maybe where I am. So dealing kind with of the speak, imposter or, syndrome, right. Right, dealing with the imposter syndrome. And so uh, I wrote this play called Shattering that was about my story and, and the moments that helped me get through all those things, the people that came along to inspire mm -hmm. me um, and present opportunities. And um, I'm kind of gifting it back on campuses and having conversations with students, but also faculty and staff because whether you're still a student or you're on the other side, right, if you're coming from where I, many times the community in which I come from, right, um, mm. the Bronx, the city, you know, folks are like, oh, what you, how you get here? Right. What you doing here, right? right? And so shattering is about getting past those moments, shattering the glass ceiling, but still dealing with the idea of race and gender. Yeah, I gotta leave you uh, for another conversation on another day we have to talk about higher education. Yes, um, yeah, Because yeah. I think we don't see too many examples. Yeah. We have many of them, we don't see too many of them. Right. Uh, and why is that? Mm -hmm. uh, but then also before we go, just real quickly, where can people find Behind the Woman? Yes, Behind the Woman is on uh, PBS, WCNY specifically. Um, it's gonna be starting again in May, but if they would like to watch the show and learn about women leaders, they can go to WCNY.org slash Behind the Woman. All right, Dr. John Rogers. Good to have you with us. Thank you for having me. All right, taking a quick break. We will be back with more right after this.